So Kenneth and Jack managed the club together, and they did that from like 1993 to the year 2000. Can we like unplug Is that the, the clock? Grandfather That's clock? the grandfather clock. You guys were doing really good too. I know. Hi hey guys, welcome to Stripper Tales and Cocktails. My name is Lisa, and this is Michelle, and we uh, used to work in strip clubs. I'm a former dancer, and she's a bartender. She danced sometimes, sometimes. but most of the time yeah. she bartended. And uh, we've danced all over the country, or worked all over the country. We've been from city to city, state to state, town to town, all For over. over 10 years. Long time. Very long and, time. And uh, almost every club we've been to has some unique story to it, or some fascinating history, and some shady stuff going down. So <laughs> yeah. we got to tell you guys about it. <laughs> so um, yeah. and today, the club that we're talking about is super fascinating. It has so much history to it. Oh my God, and crime, and murder, and all kinds of stuff. Today we're talking about the Palomino Club in fabulous Las Vegas. So the Palomino Club is, well, it's in Las Vegas, but it's not in the Las Vegas that most people know. It's located in the old part of town of Vegas called North Las Vegas. And the Palomino Club itself opened the doors in 1969. Now I'm not sure what was there before. It could have been an old building. I did a little research on there and I couldn't find the answer to that. So as far as I know, that building could have been there or um, the owner built it in 1969. But anyways, it opened its doors as a club, full nude, with alcohol in 1969. And to this day, it still runs as a full nude club with alcohol, and it's the only one in Las Vegas, okay? And there's not even many in the country that's full nude with alcohol. So this club is very unique. I do believe, I did read like recently though, that they are going to lose that licensing. So, oh, so I don't know if that yeah. happened yet. Uh, maybe you guys can comment if anybody knows, but I heard that it's supposed to be happening soon, that they will no longer be able to be nude with alcohol. So it was a grandfather thing in from 1969 when Paul Perry opened its doors. So Paul Perry, who was the original owner of the club, he opened the doors, like I said, 1969. He ran the place himself personally until 1993 when Paul Perry passed away. Mm -hmm. At that time, his wife, Gail, took over ownership. Now, Gail, she didn't like running the club herself. Um, she liked owning it. She liked getting the money, I'm sure, like who doesn't, right? But she didn't like going in there and she didn't like the daily stuff. So she left that up to her adult son, Jack, Jack Perry. So Jack Perry, whether or not Gail trusted him to run the club fully is kind of unknown, but he did have a co-manager and that guy's name was Kenneth Rowan. So Jack and Perry, they ran this club co-managers neck and neck until about the year 2000. And everything seemed okay, but I guess something must have been bubbling underneath Jack's skin between him and Kenneth. Because on an evening in the year 2000, Jack Perry took a shotgun and he walked down the long hallway to the very back office of the Palomino and he shot Kenneth Rowan in the face while Kenneth Rowan was sitting behind one of the office desks. Over onto his adult son who was next to him and he died in his arms in the wow. back office of the Palomino. That's sad. Yeah, this, this place, Lisa, it has a very dark and twisted yeah that weird yeah past as you that's, know yeah, you yeah. have some stories for us too oh about yeah this place. that's so pretty crazy mob activity like off the charts secret underground tunnels ghosts murders suicides like it's just like ah there's even not it's more really than enough crazy. to write multiple books yeah we can't fit okay. all of it in this video today we yeah got, it's just there's too much too but. much too much so lisa and i we both worked there for a short time she was a dancer and i was bartending there so while i was bartending there a drink that kind of like people order a lot was the paloma um, I don't know if it's because it sounds like the Palomino, it's very yeah. close, but it's a, it's also considered the poor man's um, margarita. So a lot of people yeah. kind of call it that yeah. because it's got tequila, it has lime, it has salt. It's very, very simple and kind of cheap to put together. So today in the honor of the Palomino, I will be making the Paloma for you guys. 
So I'm going to be doing that. Um, let's see how this works. As Lisa tells the story about right. like this like crazy like crime story that happened at the club. And I can't believe it happened uh, kind of during while we were working there, which I didn't even know about until later when we looked up. And yeah, we were there because the it was it was well kind of like we were there. Uh, we 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 started working there right after the Jack Perry incident. Yeah, so we that happened in between. the year 2000. So what, we were there, there like 2002, 2002, 2003, somewhere around there. We came in just after. Right. Yeah. And then in 2005, no, it was May of 2001. No, May of 2001, you're right, yeah, yeah, it was May of 2001, yeah. Louis Hidalgo took over, and in May of 2005... Well, shit, Lisa, let me make the drink. Oh, yeah, 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 I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah, okay, yeah. so real quick, just before she tells the story, okay. I'm just going to tell you what I'm doing. I'm going to, let me tell you what I'm doing first, and then Lisa will tell you the story, right. and while she's telling the story, I'll just do it. Okay, and then yeah. you won't need no so information. Gonna, yeah. So I have a big a bowl of ice right here. So I'm just gonna drop those into the cup. I'm gonna do a shot or two of tequila. I'm gonna squeeze some lime juice on top, and then I'm gonna salt it and mix it up a little bit, and that's our drink. So Lisa's gonna tell the story. Okay. So, okay, this guy. <laughs> I won't be so loud with my ice though. That's okay. <laughs> So um, yeah, what was it? So in uh, so we so we were there around 2001 and uh, around 2000, 2002 I think. But in 2001 um, is around the same time. An owner by the name of Louis Hidalgo. I remember this guy. I remember this piece of crap. I remember, I remember him. That guy who's uh, yes. Yeah. Oh my god. Is I cannot, he, like, he's dead now, right? Oh yeah, totally dead. So like so he he came in in 2001, took over, and then in May of 2005, his son, his girlfriend, a few other employees were all arrested, found guilty, and charged with the murder of a bouncer by the name of T.J. Hadland. Now T.J. Hadland, he worked on the outside with the taxi cab stands, and it was um. He, uh, what happened was he, you making a mess? Yes. <laughs> you are making a mess. Do you need paper towels? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> do you have paper towels? I do. I'll get it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I can smell it. it smells good. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So, where were we? TJ Hanlon. That's right. TJ Hanlon. So, TJ Hanlon, he was working the taxi cab stands outside. Now, there's a thing when, um, clubs usually have taxi cab stands outside where the taxi cabs come up and they, um, they bring the guests to the club. And uh, let me explain kickbacks, okay? Because this is what got him in trouble, got TJ in trouble. Kickbacks. Kickbacks. Kickbacks are an old fixture of the Vegas taxi industry. They're essentially a finder's fee paid to drivers by any assortment of any business. Like the cabs and yeah. stuff like that. It's basically a practice that's been in Las Vegas for decades as a way for businesses to keep a leg up on the competition. So that's what that is. Now, there's no solid proof, but what is believed to happen was TJ was pocketing the money from the club that he was supposed to be given to the cab drivers. So when the club found out what he was doing, he was instantly fired, and after he was fired, he went around town bad mouthing the club, like an idiot. Oh, so the money that he was supposed to shell out to the cabs, he was putting it He in was pocketing it, right. right. And so what he was doing was he was telling everyone that like, yo, don't go to the Palomino, go to this club instead, you don't want to go to them. Right, they're, so they're he awful. Was, so he was bad mouthing the club, turning business away. Well, Louis Hidalgo and his son caught wind of it. That's what happened. Another bouncer, by the name of D'Angelo Carroll, helped orchestrate an acquaintance of his to meet out at Lake Mead with TJ. This man's name was Kenneth Counts. He was a, basically a certified gang member from California, and D'Angelo had told him that Mr. Hidalgo wanted someone to take care of this white boy, or he and he would pay whomever killed him, pretty much. So, and uh, that's and that's what Mr. Hidalgo's son, they called Little Louis, wanted. They wanted him dead. D'Angelo Carroll. Um, was driving the white Chevy Astro that Louis Hidalgo had let him drive to do some promoting for the club uh, on the strip. And <laughs> he brought two guys along, which were like some friends of his, which uh -huh. is so stupid too because, uh, like, doesn't this, hasn't this guy ever seen, like, crime murder stories or something or, like, forensic files? I don't know. <laughs> or, like, you know, those, like, law shows. Yeah. Why would you bring two friends with you on a murder? It's like, like that's so stupid. He's like, hey <laughs> guys, I'm gonna go do a murder. You wanna go? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It was, like, really, really dumb. So, don't um, tell anybody. Yeah, so. Oh, sorry, real quick. I don't mean to cut you off, no, but. No, that's okay. I forgot to tell you guys you top everything off with squirt with this one. Okay, go ahead. Okay, no, that's okay. So, the two guys you brought along were named Jason. Uh, I think you pronounce it like Tai Poo or Tai Poo. I don't know. I'm not as bad as names with you, but oh, the this one I couldn't pronounce. Oh, I don't forget know. Forget it. That's what I you're know. doing. Yeah. And, and Ronte Zone was the other guy. They were friends of D'Angelo's and they that they brought along. They were guys that usually promoted the club and handed up flyers on the strip. So they stopped along the way. Um, so D'Angelo picked him up. They stopped along the way to pick up Kenneth Counts. 
Kenneth Counts is sitting in the van next to Ronte behind Jason, who was sitting in the front seat. So, he, um, so um, yeah, he was sitting shotgun. But then D'Angelo got a cell, um, got on his cell and uh, got on a phone call, which, by the way, was registered in Louis Hidalgo's girlfriend's name, whose name was Annabelle Espindola. Annabelle had told D'Angelo, if he's alone, go with the plan, go through with the plan. That's what she oh, told wow. D'Angelo. So they all drove up to Lake Mead until they met up at a T-shape in the road, pulled over to the side of the road, and then um, then then comes the silver Kia Sportage pulling up, and that was TJ's car. So um, when the Kia pulls up, TJ gets out of the car, he approached the van, the driver's side window, like he goes up to the driver's side window facing D'Angelo and his friend, his former co-worker, and with a 357 revolver, Count slipped uh, out of the passenger side door into the darkness of the night, far away from the bright lights of Vegas, slipped around the front of the van, snuck up um, on TJ, who stood facing D'Angelo in the driver's side window, on the side of him, completely unaware, and, and shot him point blank right in the head, um, blew his head off right then and there, and it was crazy. After they shot TJ, they left him there in the middle of the road dead, with his car running, his Kia was still running with the windows rolled down and everything, and um, they all rendezvoused left and to meet up back at the Palomino. So when they go back to the P Palomino, D'Angelo and Kenneth ran into the club, leaving Ronte and uh, Jason um, in the van, the Astro, like outside. And uh, D'Angelo walked back out of the club telling um, uh, Ronte and Jason, yeah, Lil Lou just paid me 5K for the hit, for the, for the, you know, for killing, you know, wow. dude. And, uh, oh, by the way, real quick, D'Angelo got caught. Uh, because the last call he made was they went through the dead guy's phone, TJ Handland, and the last call he was on the phone with recently was D'Angelo. Right, right, right. That's right, how right. he got caught. Which so really stupid. Oh my so god, it was so stupid. stupid. So of course he got caught. And so D'Angelo, uh, so days later, D'Angelo would wear a wire to try to make a deal with the prosecution to, um, lighten his sentence. And the district, so District Judge Valerie Adair sentenced Louis Hidalgo Jr., the son, who's 58, um, and his, oh no, it was this father, um, I think it was the father, 58, and his 27-year-old son to life in prison. Uh, both will be eligible for parole in uh, 20 years, which was about 2017 to 2019, somewhere, I think, somewhere around there. Um, because I don't know exactly when they went to jail. It was somewhere between the, um, years of 20, 2005 and 2009 when they actually went in, so I don't know. Right, because it took a got, while yeah, after the you know, murder for yeah. them to get the sentence. You know, it's weird. So, um, a jury convicted both of second-degree murder, conspiracy to commit battery with a deadly weapon, and battery resulting in substantial bodily harm in connection with the death of 44-year-old Timothy Hadland. And this guy had, like, four kids. Like, oh, that sucks, you know? So, so, like, they lost their father. I mean, the guy wasn't the brightest, probably, like, going around talking smack and pocketing money, you know? Yeah, but so he got murdered because he was yeah. just taking cab money that was supposed to go it's to the cab so drivers stupid. to yeah, bring the customers like, to the club. Right. It was pretty dumb. Uh, Annabelle, the girlfriend, guess what? She turned state witness on Lou and has since disappeared. Oh, really? She did. Yeah. Wow. She yeah, did. yeah. So to this yeah. day, they don't know where that is. They don't know where she went. Yeah, she turned ah. to get witness. She's out. Run she's Annabelle. Good. Yeah. I mean, she's free. She's whatever. She's good to go because she did it to get a better free, deal. Free. As for Kenneth Counts, <laughs> the shooter, he's been out on the streets for like 10 years. The actual shooter did less time than everybody else. <laughs> How is that possible, you ask? Because they didn't have a strong case against him, and he had witnesses that said that he was at a picnic with his family. Ah. Well, and also he's not, not, he's technically, I guess he's not the mastermind, right? So I guess they usually no. do go after the master. So they Kind of like Charles Manson, yeah. where he didn't actually kill anybody, but he got more time right. probably than anybody because he yeah. masterminded the whole deal. Okay. So, yeah. uh, well, how's the drink? Oh, yeah, do you yeah, like it? Sorry. So, um, so I, I was so wrapped up telling <laughs> yeah, the story. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know if it's a great story. Somebody died, but uh, it's it's very interesting. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, isn't it good? It's very light. Yeah, it tastes like a 7 up. I like it because you can choose to make it really, really strong, right? Like how much, yeah, you know, detail you want to put yeah, in. Yeah, you can put as much so, as you want. This tastes like a really, really good seven up, and then you just top it with squirt. Thing, yeah, That's it, which is like a grapefruit soda. I mean, it doesn't. This is a name brand, isn't it? Yeah, squirt. This is really, really good. Actually, I was drinking one of these um, when I went back in the the dressing room, and I was getting, you know, I went in the back because you know when we, when I bartended there, you were allowed to drink, mm -hmm. and it was actually I was drinking one of these, and I went back there and I was trying to fix my hair and stuff like that when I felt like a, a cold breeze kind of go past my shoulder and I, re I, I saw my hair go like this. 
And I looked at one of the dancers, Dolce there, and I said, I remember her. Yeah. Uh, and I said, Dulcie, what? If you're out there and you see this, oh my God, please hit us up. <laughs> we miss yeah. you. Yeah. Say hi. She uh, we awesome. won't say her real name. We'll just say her stage name. But uh, that was her stage name. Hopefully she recognizes us and she's like, oh yeah, we're those guys. I don't know. But yeah, I'm not kidding. I felt like this this breeze. And I and I told Dulcie, I'm like, oh, is there like a vent on or something? She goes, oh, it's probably the girl, the dancer who committed suicide in the dressing room. That's creepy. I'm like, what? So she told me this story about a dancer and there's there's uh, different um, stories, like a variety of different reasons why she killed herself. But it seems like the, the most common one was that she was a dancer there at the Palomino Club in the 70s. And she was young, 18, 19 ish. Mm -hmm. And she had become pregnant with one of the customers. So this was a girl who was supposedly Ooh. out prostituting herself, supposedly is just a, a version of the story. Yeah. And she had become pregnant. Um, she wasn't going to be able to dance anymore because she was going to have a baby. You know, her stomach yeah. was going to get bigger. She didn't have the money for an abortion, nor did she really want to get an abortion. She didn't know if her parents would accept her. And after crying in the dressing room, she decided to make the decision to just end her life there in the dressing room. So that's the story that I got. I've seen different variations of the story, you know, from like ghost shows and things like that. I'm sure you guys can look this up. Um, I think Ghost Hunters, is it Ghost Hunters? Oh, or yeah. Ghost oh. Adventures? Something like One that, One of them yeah. does, and they talk a little bit about this girl, and they bring a psychic in, and supposedly they talk to her. I'm not really sure. But I'll tell you, I would feel a cold breeze every once in a while in that dressing room. Yeah. I felt something, and we have taken pictures in that dressing room us and a bunch of girls and you would see a bright light and it was right in oh, front of the locker and the, i remember that picture it was like a thing coming yeah down. if, like if we stuff. find it we'll put it up here in the video um we were standing in front of the lockers and there's like a light beam and every time we took a picture in this specific area and so the girl you know we we're told that she right. hung herself right there um there was a light beam and then there's one picture that it looks like a girl's butt from behind like if she's bending, bending over, over you could see it in the picture like if she got in front of us and bent over yeah. you know like yeah for the picture right in front of us right do you remember yeah. that i remember the picture but i don't know if i'm gonna dig it up. i don't yeah i don't know if i'll be able to find it but yeah. we did have that pic i definitely think i have the ones with the light beam so yeah we'll, we'll, we'll post it we'll like here somewhere we'll, if, um, yeah I, we can if I yeah can we it, have yeah. it but that was, it was very creepy. And then if you watch one of the Ghost Adventure shows, supposedly she's like dancing on the she's stage. She's dancing for them, I remember that. Yeah, she was like dancing. Like, they, they use like a heat lamp or something. Yeah, I don't weird. Know ghost well, they talk about that. how they saw Paul Perry walking around there. We have a friend of ours. Right, PK saw yeah, PK, the he's, original owner. He was, um, he told me that he, um, yeah, he's he worked there, uh, he's worked there a long time. And he's a good friend of ours. And um, he, uh, he said he's seen Paul walking around in his suit. And uh, that's crazy that this man, that place the, is it's I, so crazy. I would love like, to go there one day and just do you know what ghosts. Sucks? Like, it's like we worked there and we had no idea this stuff was going on when we worked there. Well, I and I like, knew about, about the, the, suicide, the suicide girl, but, but I, I didn't know about Paul Perry. I didn't know about that the, either. And the then murders, the murder, or, and then the Louis Hidalgo one because it's like that that happened between 2001 and 2005, and at that time I think I left. I don't know if you stayed or when we left the Palomino, because we left, I think about 2002, 2003, we left. And it was somewhere in between that time when that murder happened to TJ Headland. And uh, I don't think we were on for that, but um, I, it, 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 might have, it might have happened during though. But you know, when you walk in that place, it's so like dated it looking. Is. And it has such a like, ugh, like creep you out yeah. vibe. It does, because it looks like the 70s in there. It looks like some, like a lot of like, like Ron Paul, what's that guy with the big mustache from the 70s? Ron Jeremy. Oh, it looks like Ron <laughs> Jeremy's been taking it looks like his like with his mustache on the stage God, there. I remember like there was a guy like at your 70s bar porn film that you said there was a comedian that you were hanging out with and he was like roasting the place when you were serving him drinks at the bar. Oh, yeah. Like, we fun of the velvet we did get a lot of celebrities in yeah. there, yeah, and they would make fun of the place and, and <laughs> stuff like that, make fun of the. But in a way, it's kind of, it, as weird as it is, that's what kind of gives it character it does too. yeah because there's no other place like that when you go to like other strip clubs in vegas they're like very flashy very modern very right. up to date this is like if you 
stepped back into a time machine and went back into the 70s yeah. to go see like, oh my God, like a me? Like you really when feel like that. you walk in that club, it smells like 1972. So yeah, <laughs> it's it smells so, like the smell is still there. That's probably why the ghosts like it because they're like, nothing's changed. Yeah, this, this is, is really good, yeah. by the way. So if you're like somebody mm. who likes to go to like diners that look like the 1950s because you like the idea of being like transported through right. time, Hey, check out a 1970 transported yeah. nudie club, right? Because this is the place for you with ghosts and everything. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's really weird there. Well, totally. Yeah, it's super and weird. You worked there for how long? As oh, an answer. God, I don't remember. It was only for like a year or two. I didn't work there long. Because you started off when they the downstairs was open. Right. And then they closed the downstairs to remodel, which I don't know what the fuck they remodeled because yeah, once they were done, it looked it's exactly weird. the same. And they sent <laughs> all the girls. They sent all the girls upstairs to this tiny, tiny oh, little baby so stage. Yeah. yeah. And, and remember we did the walkout. Oh yeah, all the dancers the walkout. walked out. That's right. Oh they man. They got pissed because they shut down the downstairs and they stuck everybody upstairs and no customers were there. Yeah. So we the dancers it. were like, "Well, what the fuck? We're paying a house fee. We're paying you, okay? Right. So that you can bring us customers. Like that's the deal." And you're not bringing us the customers, right. so fuck you. And they all just like walked off, pretty much. And I'm just pretty, like, yeah, okay. just, yeah. I remember that we were like, we just grabbed all of our shit and we walked the fuck out. It was great. It was pretty cool. Yeah. And that was like at like three in the morning. <laughs> I know. But the club was open till what, like six a.m. or yeah. Something. And then you know what? There was like hundreds of other clubs that we just go to anyway. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many. Well, thanks for joining us for another story, uh, another tale, and uh, a drink. And yeah. uh, thanks for listening to your story on the Palomino. Join us next time. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Please like and subscribe. And if you have any comments, have you ever been to the Palomino? Do you know anyone that's ever worked there? Do, Do you know if it's still yeah. nude with is alcohol? It? Yeah, is it? Yeah, because we don't know. Yeah, and if you have anything to comment about any of the stories. We're lazy reporters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's a simple Google, and we're like, oh, you guys tell us. <laughs> you tell us. <laughs> So let us know. Uh, yeah, but thanks for joining us and see you next time. Bye. Enjoy your drink. Bye. Bye.